And finally, we're going to look at Kepler's laws of motion. Now, Johannes Kepler was an astronomer and physicist who was the first to actually measure the orbits of the planets. Prior to him existed Nicholas Copernicus. Copernicus, you might have read about, he was the first astronomer to propose the sun being the center of our solar system, or rather the center of the universe, actually. Before him, Plato and Aristotle believed that the Earth was the immovable center of the universe. Copernicus was the first to suggest it was the sun and not the Earth, but couldn't prove it. Johannes Kepler was the first person to prove that the planets went around the sun, that the Earth was one of the planets that were known at the time, all five planets known at the time, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, uh, Jupiter, and Saturn. And Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto were known at that time. Pluto's no longer a planet. Anyway, the planets follow elliptical paths about the sun, with the sun at one focus. Now, an ellipse is a special geometric shape. A circle is a type of an ellipse. But an ellipse, you can think of it like an oval. And to draw a circle, what you do is you pin down one end of a string, put a pencil on the other end of a string, keep it taut, and draw a circle around that, keeping the string taut. An ellipse is the same way. You attach a string at one focus, attach a string at the other focus, and keeping, attach the string between those two points, and keeping your pencil taut, you draw a shape. Now, the planets are not nearly as elliptical as shown here, where the sun is here on the left, this is the empty focus. So sometimes this fictional planet is very close to the sun, sometimes it's very far away. Comets have similar orbits to this, like Halley's Comet. Planets are more circular. In fact, Venus is almost a perfect circle. But it's not a perfect circle. Previous to Kepler, astronomers believed, including Copernicus, um, Galileo, and, and bef before those times, uh, Plato, uh, um, Ptolemy, and so on, they believed that planets must travel in perfect circles around the sun, or that the planets travel in per perfect circles around the Earth. Perfect circles were a big geometric um, must have for any astronomical model of the heavens. Kepler showed that that's not the case, that the planetary orbits are not circles. So we have here planets moving in and, and planets moving in elliptical orbits around the sun. That means that there's a time where the Earth is a little bit closer to the sun and the Earth is a little bit further away. The Earth is on average about 93 million miles away from the Sun, 150 million kilometers. Sometimes it's a few million, million kilometers closer. Sometimes it's a few million kilometers further away. This has nothing to do with the seasons. Earth is actually closest to the Sun in around January when the Northern Hemisphere is in its winter and furthest from the Sun in July when the Northern Hemisphere is in its summer. That distance change between the closest and the furthest is so small for Earth, it does not contribute to the seasons. The tilt of the Earth's axis contributes to the seasons. So this is Kepler's first law. Kepler's second law of planetary motion is often called the equal areas law. It states that each planet moves, so an imaginary line connecting the sun and the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. So for example, a planet moving from here point one to point two. Imagine there, here's the sun. The sun here is in the middle. Imagine a line connecting the sun to the planet at time t1. That planet moves in its orbit to t2. It sweeps out the area here shown in red. That area has to remain the same for the same time interval. So for example, the blue area here is actually the same amount of area as the red area. This triangle is short and fat. This triangle is tall and thin, but they have the same area. 
So that means since they have the same area, the time between orbits T1 and T2, the time it took the planet to go over this whole big distance, is the same amount of time it takes the planet to go between T3 and T4. So planets travel very slowly when they're further from the sun and travel very quickly when they're close to the sun. Now, if the orbit is perfectly circular, that speed never changes. It's uniform circular motion. The speed stays the same as the planet goes around and around and around. But the more and more elliptical the orbit is, the faster the planet or comet moves when it's close to the sun and the slower it moves when it's far away. And this is one of the reasons Halley's Comet is such a rare event. It takes Halley's Comet 76 years to go around the sun. Its closest approach is closer to the sun than Earth is. Its furthest approach is further than the orbit, or it's around the orbit of Neptune. So when Halley's Comet is near the sun, when it's close enough to the sun to heat up to sea, it flies by so quickly it's only around Earth and the sun's orbit for about six months before flying off, spending decades out at the distant part of its orbit. And finally, we come to Kepler's third law, the period semi-major axis rule. Kepler's third law states the ratio of the squares of the periods of any two planets, the period is how long does it take to go around the sun, the period of orbit. So for Earth, that's one year. For Mercury, it's about 88 days. Is equal to the ratio of the cubes of their average distances from the sun. So the equation form, the period of planet one, and the period is given by the, the capital T is a time, but it's, a, it's not small t, it's capital T is used. Capital T, period of the first planet squared over the period of the second planet squared. So the ratio of the squares of the periods is equal to the ratio of the cubes of the average distances from the sun. So if we know, for example, how long it takes the Earth to go around the sun and the average distance the Earth is from the sun, and we know how long it takes Mars to go around the sun, we can solve and figure out how far away Mars is from the sun on average. This is a pretty powerful technique. It means that the planets, since they all orbit the sun, have a relationship with one another. That the periods in the seven major axes are the average distances from the sun. Um, another phrase for that is called the semi-major axis. But the average distance from the sun cubed is related to the period squared. Another way of writing this very simply, if, for example, we use Earth as planet number two, the period of Earth is one year. One squared is one. The distance from Earth, we're going to call it an astronomical unit. That's the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. One astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. One cubed is one. So another way of writing this is t squared is equal to r cubed if t is in years and r is in astronomical units. So if you make these measurements, if you measure the planetary orbit in years and the distance r in astronomical units, one astronomical unit is about 93 million miles or 150 million kilometers. If you plug in, then you can figure out, if you know what the period of Mars is in years, plug it in, it'll give you the distance in astronomical units. Or if you know what the, the distance of Venus is from the Sun in astronomical units, plug it in, it'll give you the, Venus, the period of Venus in years. If you don't have those measurements in years or astronomical units, then you have to go back to this equation. So if the period is measured in seconds, you have to plug in the period in seconds for both of these. If R, the average distance, is measured in meters, you have to go in and plug in the average distance for each of these. So this is the general form of the relationship. And then if you have the measurements in specific quantities, years and astronomical units, you can use this.